my wild swing for the fences theory here is that this Super Mario movie is gonna be a musical. Peaches, 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 peaches. Nailed it. Fun fact, that song Peaches, yeah, that thing is now eligible for the Best Original Song Oscar. Academy Award winning songwriter King Koopa has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Hello, Internet! It's a me, a Film Theory, the show that definitely beat the obstacle course on the first try. So, the Super Mario Brothers movie came out, and let me just say it, it was a blast. Was it high cinema? Kino, as the kids online say? No, obviously not. The pacing was a bit uneven, the random 80s pop song inserts just didn't work, and Peach's motivations for taking Mario with her on the adventure were weaker than a stack of Goombas. But darn it, if I didn't have a smile plastered across my face the second the GameCube jingle played as a cell phone ringtone. Or when the brothers platformed their way through a 2D construction site. Or when the DK rap kicked into high gear during Donkey Kong's WrestleMania entrance. So awesome. On that topic though, that was probably my biggest complaint about the movie. The creator of the DK rap isn't credited. Yeah, while all the other songs have their writers and musicians properly credited, the DK rap is just from Donkey Kong 64. Real classy there, Universal. I mean, I know Seth Rogen said, Objectively, one of the worst rap songs of all time. But that doesn't mean that the man behind this masterpiece, epic game composer Grant Kirkhope, should be overlooked. Artists deserve to be credited for their hard work, and that includes the DK rap, no matter what Seth Rogen thinks about it. And the snub was obviously enough to upset Grant, so here's what I propose, loyal theorists. Let's work together to change the Mario movie. If you have yourself a Twitter account, go and use that toxic platform to do some good today. Tweet at Universal, or specifically at Universal Picks, P-I-C-S, asking them to change the credits in the digital release of the Mario movie to include all the proper credits for the writers and performers of the DK rap. And make sure you use the hashtag Save the DK rap so we can get this puppy trending. If it gets enough attention, if media outlets and YouTubers and streamers start making enough noise with the story, maybe Grant and everyone else who worked on this thing will get the credit that they deserve for writing a song that so many people love, or at least me. It was, I was so hyped when they played this. I will fully admit my bias here. I'm not usually the type to get really excited about nostalgic, like, member berry stuff, but man, that was an Easter egg I did not see coming and it hit hard. But beyond the music, the missing credits, and the beautiful animations, we all know what I was really there to see. The lore! Let me tell you there, friends, there was so much in this thing. We here at Theorist HQ actually have a ton of ideas, and we're definitely going to be diving further once it's available to scour frame by frame, so super jump on that subscribe button right now so you get notified of when all those episodes come out, but as of today, in true video game fashion, we're going to be speed running our way through four mini theories that may just change the way you look at these core Mario characters forever. Today we're covering everything from Peach's mysterious origins and the twisted logic of the Mushroom Kingdom to the realities of the wider meta Mario-verse, so suck down a mushroom and design yourself a cart, friendos, let's go! So let's kick things off with theory number one, you cannot die in the Mushroom Kingdom. One subtle detail that I think most people overlooked in this new movie is how they visualize the damage that Mario is taking. Through all of the punishment that he takes in the Mushroom Kingdom, Mario comes away basically unscathed. For instance, in the arena battle against Donkey Kong, Mario gets rocked. He's grabbed, smashed, tossed, slammed, and made into the equivalent of plumber Play-Doh. And yet, his body reflects none of that damage. He is literally on the verge of passing out. There's not a scrape or bruise on him, either during or after the fight. Big deal, right? It's a Mario movie. What do I expect? It's not like they're gonna show the main character bleeding or something. Except, that's exactly what they show us during the movie's final fight. During the final battle, all the characters are sucked back out of the warp pipe and launched into Brooklyn. And here, we once again see Mario taking a lot of hard knocks. Except this time, his body is showing all the damage, complete with a black eye and a bruise on his cheek. I mean, these sorts of design choices aren't made casually, especially for big feature film collaborations between two companies like this. And especially when one of those companies is Nintendo, one that's so protective of their characters that they gave Disney notes about how Bowser would hold his teacup in Wreck-It Ralph. It's also not like Bowser was rougher with Mario out here than anything we saw happen inside the Mushroom Kingdom. There are multiple occasions where both Mario and Luigi probably should have died during their adventures. Adding to this idea, early on in the movie we see Bowser uses flame breath on a disobedient Koopa, but instead of killing him, this act scorches off all his 
outer flesh, transforming that Koopa from a turtle into a dry bones. What this tells us is that people's biologies seem to act differently across the different worlds or kingdoms of the Mario universe, and that, for whatever reason, the Mushroom Kingdom is one where your spirit or living self is somehow contained within the bones of your body. What this tells me is that in the final act of the movie, as Luigi is lowered down into the pit of lava and nearly burns to death, what really would have happened if that scene had continued would have been him turning into a living skeleton rather than immediate and permanent death. Still a downgrade from fleshy human status for sure, but hey, at least it's not death death. So take a chill pill there, Luigi. Death only appears to be permanent if it's out in the real world. Theory number two. Did you notice the cavalcade of Nintendo references that are packed into this movie? Of course you did. It's impossible not to notice them. There were so many in this thing that the new Rockstar's Easter egg video that breaks this puppy down is gonna be longer than the actual movie. Some of my personal favorites, obviously the songs I mentioned earlier, like the DK rap, but there was also the Super Mario rap from their old TV show that was used in the commercial. Oh, we're the Mario Brothers and Plummins. All the construction signs have Game & Watch characters on them. That's really fun. There's the shot of Mario versus Bowser framed like it's a KO in Super Smash at the end. And that moment that Mario defeats Bowser by launching him with his tail. A direct callback to Mario 64. But it was the non-Mario game references that got me the most interested. Mario has a toy R-Wing model from Star Fox in his room. There's an F-Zero poster hanging from his wall. The Punch-Out Pizzeria is a big old nod to the boxing adventures of Little Mac, which is also fitting since Mario was the referee of that original game. There's also an Ice Climbers Easter egg on one of the awnings of the streets of Brooklyn. There's the whole scene of him playing Kid Icarus, which we're gonna talk about a lot more later. But to me, it's what isn't there that stands out the most. In a movie that's literally a Nintendo victory lap, crammed full of every IP they got, the omissions are telling. Did you notice the distinct lack of anything related to Zelda, Metroid, Pokemon, Kirby? Well, that tells me that Nintendo has carved those IP out to shop around. I suspect that according to the contract, anything that appears in this movie would have to have been committed to a production in partnership with Illumination. And since those are the main IP that Nintendo is lining up to continue their multimedia movie push, keeping them out was an intentional choice to have them remain as free agents. Speaking of missing characters, the Mario movie is literally a timeline of Mario games. The whole thing begins with Mario and Luigi talking to Foreman Spike about their construction jobs and being part of the Wrecking Crew, and it all ends with Bowser's wedding where he wears the exact outfit from Mario Odyssey. Basically, this thing is giving you a complete picture of Mario across the years beginning to end. And then they put in practically every power-up you'd want to see in this thing. Mushrooms, stars, fire flowers, sure, that's to be expected, but also mini mushrooms, tanuki suits, ice flowers, the freaking cat suit? That made me wonder, where could they possibly go next? When your first film is literally a highlight reel of 35 years worth of games, what else can you possibly include? Well, obviously, with Bowser temporarily out of commission, the next one has got to star Wario and our meme lord and savior Waluigi trying to nab Yoshi eggs from Yoshi's Island. That one seems like a no-brainer. Maybe he throws some Koopalings in there for good measure. And after that, we're gonna be taking a trip to space to explore some galaxies. Or finally, I'd expect we meet our last and most important character, Rosalina. And it's then, in the proposed third movie of this trilogy, where we'll be revealed Peach's origins. Which then brings brings us to theory number three, Peach is a star. During a scene in Act 2, as Mario, Peach, and Toad are on their way to try and recruit the Kong army against Bowser's invasion, the trio spend a night in a field full of fire flowers. Mario and Peach use the opportunity to do some character development, telling each other, and the audience, about their backstories and motivations. And it's here that Peach reveals that she doesn't know where she's from. The only thing that she does know is that it's not the Mushroom Kingdom. It's here that we see her earliest memory, arriving in the Mushroom Kingdom from a pipe as an infant, and then getting adopted by the Toads. Mario wonders if Peach could be a human from his world, but given the way Peach reacts to this question, I kind of doubt it. She just kind of softly smiles, turns away, looks up at the night sky, and says, it's a big universe out there with a lot of galaxies. Now, if that right there isn't a giant neon billboard spelling out theory baits, I don't know what is. So obviously, it seems like they're setting up some future films to explore Mario galaxy stuff. And that stuff is going to be directly related to Peach's backstory. But I suspect we can actually get more specific here. Hear me out on this, but but what if Peach is literally a humanoid star? One of the superstars that somehow taken human form. Might sound like a stretch, but let's look at some of the evidence. If we look back at that scene where baby Peach arrives in the Mushroom Kingdom, there's lots of little details that start adding to the theory. Firstly, Peach arrives out of a pipe that's constantly glowing. Unlike Mario, who arrives in a pipe that flashes as it spits him out, but then turns entirely dark. That right there tells me there's some really 
powerful magic on the other side of that pipe. And the most powerful thing that we see in this world are the superstars. And wouldn't you know it, they glow just like the pipe. Secondly, the skirt that Baby Peach is wearing in this scene is covered in a repeating pattern of stars and moons. A character's design in an important flashback like this likely had input from everyone up the chain of command in both Illumination and Nintendo. So this detail is something that they 100% wanted in there. Thirdly, Peach is clearly powerful. Not only is she a capable warrior, but it also appears like she's always been powerful, since she was able to do the obstacle course that Mario struggles with on her first try. The only other time we see anyone as capable as her is when Mario and Luigi have the power of the superstar at the end of the movie. Also, this is a bit of a minor point, but I figured I should mention it. We also see both baby Mario and baby Luigi in the film, and both of them have these weird little beady eyes, basically just pupils without the white sclera around it. But baby Peach, her eyes are fully formed. They're big and they're blue and they have a giant sclera. Probably has more to do with being consistent with the already existing designs of the baby versions of these characters that we see in the video games, but it does certainly add more evidence to the Peach isn't human pile. The babies that we know are humans have eyes that look this way, and the babies that might not be human but might come from outer space look like this. Another big point here, when Peach first meets Mario, she excitedly asks him, you're a human, you are a human, right? Before commenting that she thought he'd be bigger and asking where he came from. But obviously that then begs the question, how does Peach know what a human is? For someone who grew up with a race of fungus people since she was a literal infant, it's a weird piece of knowledge to have. The bigger issue here though is that kids lose their memories. At a certain point in childhood, usually around the age of three when they become verbal, they undergo what's known as childhood amnesia, the natural and gradual loss of memories from the first few years of life. In this scene, we see Peach using a pacifier, but also able to walk. Now, human babies begin walking anywhere between 10 and 18 months, and pacifiers can honestly hang around as long as parents are willing to let their kids use them. The long and short of this is that Peach in this scene is probably around the age of two, and even if Peach were a human and knew about it at this age, that knowledge would likely have been lost as part of the childhood amnesia process. Instead, the knowledge of what a human is seems more like some sort of innate knowledge that an intergalactic traveler might have, or at least someone who's gotten a lot of knowledge about the different galaxies and the races that are contained therein. There's also a ton of evidence that we can actually bring in here from the games as well. In some truly ancient game theories that are almost nine years old at this point, we talked about the origins and parentage of the character Rosalina, a space-traveling princess from the Mario Galaxy games, who is, quite literally, mother to the stars. Those theories are great, by the way. They hold up really well. They're old, but man, to this day, they are some of my favorites that we've ever done. Anyway, to quickly summarize here, throughout Super Mario Galaxy, Rosalina reads from a storybook about a sad little girl in search of a Luma's missing mother. Though it's never explicitly stated, the story is likely about Rosalina herself. In the book, we see glimpses of Rosalina's mother, who looks an awful lot like Peach, and who also has herself Peach's earrings. We also see Rosalina's childhood castle, one that has itself the exact same silhouette as Peach's castle in most depictions, symmetrical spires on the sides, and one large spire in the middle. Genetically, Rosalina's eye color, hair color, earlobes, and even her left-handedness would all match with Peach. And even the author of this storybook portion of the game has gone on record to say that his original intent was for Rosalina and Peach to be related. There's also the French translation of this story, which makes mention of a father's signature mustache. So isn't it suspicious then that the movie goes out of its way to further the connection between Peach and other galaxies? The filmmakers are outright doing everything in their power but spelling out Peach's Rosalina's mom in the night sky. Additionally, the captive nihilistic Luma Lee from the movie outright says, time, like hope, is an illusion. Another point towards that old theory of iterative variants of the universe and the connection between Peach and the stars. I suspect that in movie three, they'll be coming to this realization of the family connection, and then there'll be a final reset of the timeline to start things all over again. Exactly what we saw with the original Mario Galaxy. And finally, that brings us to theory number four, or I guess more observation number four. As we talked about earlier, we see Mario playing Kid Icarus on the Nintendo Entertainment System, the very first home console that Nintendo released stateside. Now at first, you might be thinking to yourself, so what? Famous Nintendo product being featured as an Easter egg in a movie about Nintendo's biggest franchise. What's the big deal with that? Well, it's actually huge. You see, if Mario's a real person in this universe, that means that his games don't exist. Now, some version of Donkey Kong, or in this case, Jumpman, still exists in this universe. We see an altered version of the original Donkey Kong arcade cabinet in the Punch-Out Pizzeria, with a Yeti in place of DK, and different humans in the places of Mario and Lady. But everything that Mario as an IP has touched doesn't really seem to be a thing in this world. The existence of the Punch-Out Pizzeria means that Mike Tyson's Punch-Out couldn't have been a game. In fact, Mario's complete lack of acknowledgement towards any of the Mushroom Kingdom, Donkey Kong, Koopa Army, the Yoshi imagery, all of 
that means that basically nothing related to Mario Brothers or Yoshi's Island or Donkey Kong Country exist as video games in this world. Now, on the surface, that might not seem like much, until you remember that without the Mario games, there would be no Nintendo. See, when the NES hit store shelves, the United States was in the midst of the video game crash of 1983. Consumers didn't trust video games because there had been such a huge surplus of poorly made garbage games, like the infamous Atari version of E.T. years before. That sentiment was only able to get turned around when Nintendo released the Nintendo Entertainment System, marketing the thing as more of a toy than a video game, which proved games really could be good, actually. And the main way they proved that, the original Super Mario Bros. platformer was a pack-in title for the console. Americans only started to trust video games again when they popped in Super Mario Bros. and saw that it was a high-quality, fun game. And the numbers absolutely reflect this fact. The Nintendo Entertainment System had a launch lineup of 17 games, including the likes of Kung Fu, Hogan's Alley, Gyromite, Excite Bike, a lot of ones that, you know, really set the world on fire, clearly. And then, of course, he had the creatively titled games like Golf, Pinball, Baseball, and, of course, there was also Mario. And of that group, Mario stood head and shoulders above the rest. Of the NES's top five selling games, three of them are Mario games. Super Mario Brothers alone, as a pack-in title for the console, sold 40 million units. It is one of the top selling video games of all time. Those Mario games at the top of the list total around 65 million units sold. The only game in the top five to not be a pack-in or Mario game sold 8 million. Zelda, Nintendo's second highest performing IP, only sold 6.5 million. And don't even get me started on Kid Icarus, who couldn't even crack the top 30 with only 1.7 million units sold. What I'm trying to say here is that without the Mario games, the NES likely wouldn't have caught the public's attention, and Nintendo likely wouldn't have survived the changing era of entertainment. Heck, video gaming itself may not have existed as a medium, considering that Mario was the game that won back everyone's trust. At the very least, the industry would have likely been set back by at least a decade from where it is today. No Super Mario means no new revolutionary 3D video game controls with Mario 64. That then translates to no new 3D platformer revolution, leading to games like Banjo-Kazooie, Spyro the Dragon, and Ocarina of Time. No Mario Kart, no Super Smash Brothers, completely omitting two of the most impactful and highest selling video game franchises of all time. And the lackluster growth of video games would probably also translate to differences in the Sony PlayStation and Xbox. And all of this is without even touching all the ancillary businesses like the CGI tech, all the amazing lighters and shaders and game engines that have been built off the backs of gaming. And all of that gaming off the back of Mario. With Mario being a real guy in this world instead of a video game character, it means that one of the other Nintendo IPs had to have been the one that spearheaded the revival of video gaming as we know it. And based on the fact that Mario has F-Zero posters and Star Fox replicas, but no Triforce merch, no Kirby plushie, no Samus calendar, it means that none of them were made into games in this universe either. In short, what we're seeing in the Mario movie is a timeline where Kid Icarus was the killer app for Nintendo's rebirth of gaming. All its vertical platforming, all its eggplants, all of this. Oh no, we've entered into the darkest timeline. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. Given the wild success of the Mario movie and the Last of Us series, I expect we're gonna be seeing a lot more of these video game tie-ins in the future. I mean, we're already apparently getting a Minecraft movie led by Jason Momoa, and I shudder to think about what we're gonna have to talk about on this channel when the FNAF movie finally comes out, but we'll be there! So, if you wanna see what theories we come up with when those movies start releasing trailers, smash that subscribe button like you're smashing Bowser in the face. That way, you're gonna be the first to see when all of those things go live. And as always, my friends, I will see you next week.